roles. What are some of the big challenges you deal with communicating with different generations in the workplace? Right, so even communicating tone, nuance, in all these different ways, because they are very different face-to-face -face versus email versus texting. So how do I communicate that? That's a great one. What else? What else came up at your tables? Checking body languages to see how messages are perceived. So what's some of the challenges around the checking the body language? Yeah, big time. So what she's saying is that in email and text, of course, we don't have the luxury of body language. We can't see it, so we don't know how that message is actually translating. Then that's not the same thing as with face-to-face. -face. Any others? One more, another challenge that came up in your groups. Some can't read. Some can't read. So what do I do about that? Right? So what do I do with people who may not read, who may not be as literate? All of these different challenges that come up and all the different ways in which we communicate. So this is what we're going to be exploring today because we have a lot of different perceptions and assumptions about the different generations in the workplace. And yet the reality is this. Change is not even ahead, the change is already here. You're all dealing with it right now. And one of the biggest questions I get asked all the time, no matter what the industry is, how do we attract, retain, and engage our people? Especially the younger generation, how do we attract them in the first place? How do we keep them? because they don't seem to want to stay in a job for very long and they want to continue moving on. Is anyone experiencing that here? Absolutely. It's happening everywhere. And here's part of our perception of the younger generation, our Gen Y, or our millennials as we call them. Most, the two most frequent words we hear to describe them are lazy and entitled. And look at this. They actually are hurting the cereal industry because they think cereal takes too much effort. I cannot take the time to put cereal in a bowl, pour milk on top of it, and eat it spoonful by spoonful, because that takes too much time. This is the image that we have of millennials. But the thing is this. If you actually go further into that article, what it talks about is the reasons why millennials don't actually like eating cereal and why the cereal industry is struggling with their sales is because millennials are actually that much more keen to get to work. And because in this day and age where there's often a commute involved, they want to grab something on the go. They want to get their smoothie, they want to get their breakfast bar or their breakfast burrito and get to work. But this is part of what challenges us, is not only our own perceptions and beliefs, but then what we see in the media, who love to take advantage of the stereotypes. And for most people, we read those headlines, and how often do we go into the article? We don't. By and large, we look at that and we're like, yep, those darn lazy millennials. These are part of the challenges that we have. But there's a reason why we have to start really looking at these generational differences and how to take advantage of the strengths of each. Because I want you to consider some of these stats, and you are already living this reality. Stat number one. For the first time in human history, there are more people in Canada approaching the end of life than the beginning. That's where we're at in time right now. Our baby boomers are starting to retire, and within the next decade, for every two people retiring, there will be less than one person to take their place. Consider what that means for our workforce. Our birth rates have been declining for the last 25 years, and families are not having enough children to replace parents in the workplace at retirement age. So we are only getting into a situation that is deteriorating over time. So this brings us to a point in time where we are already experiencing a tremendous shift in our workforce. And it is forcing us to change how we lead, how we communicate, how we recruit and retain workers. And this is why it becomes really important for us to understand how do I engage and communicate with each of these different generations? Because I have so much competition out there. There are so many more opportunities now for people in terms of where they can go and what they can do. So first, let's look at how did we get here? This is going to be a little bit of a history exam for some of you, depending on, well, or all of you, really, but we'll see how many of you remember your history. Because we have to consider how did we get to this place in time and what actually happened. So we're going to start back in 1939. 
1939-1945, what happened? World War II, correct. The end of the war, think about this, the average soldier returning from war was in his early 20s. They'd been away for years under extreme stressful situations. What do you think they did when they came home and they were busy celebrating? What was there a lot of right after World War II? For the, yeah, there was a lot of, yes, let's just say it, there was a lot of sex going on. And ba-boom, we literally have the creation and the beginning of the baby boomer generation. The largest single demographic group in modern history. So yes, I hate to tell you this, but your parents, grandparents had a lot of sex in the 1940s. For most of you who are baby boomers, this is how it happened. But then, of course, we start moving into the 1960s. And there's an invention created that starts putting the first nail in the coffin for our demographics. Anyone can guess what that was? Yes, ladies, you know this. The birth control pill was invented in the early 1960s. And suddenly, having a big family, lots of children, it's not the same thing anymore. So as we move into the 1960s, right when the baby boomers should, in theory, be having lots of kids, like their parents had, that's not happening anymore. Birth rates start to decline. Baby boomers are like, actually, no, I'm going to take a bit of a rain check on that, having a big family, and if I'm going to have maybe just a couple of kids, and, or if anything, I'm going to start having them a little bit later. So for the first time, we see the birth rates starting to plummet. Then we move into the 1960s and the 1970s. At this point, we have a great deal of social unrest. We, of course, have fe the feminism movement, the civil rights movement. Again, all these reasons and this pushback against the establishment as to why I'm not going to settle down and create these large, big families. So this is a lot of what we see. And we also start to see, for the first time, by the end of the, the, the mid to end of the 70s, we start to see the emergence of women entering the workforce and double income families. So now imagine this. And most of you know this reality now, when both parents are working, you're working really hard, you're working all week long, what starts taking a nosedive? More sex. Yeah, that's really what, you, you get the point, right, of how the demographics gets created. So as we move into the 70s and the 80s, how many of you owned a house in the early 80s? How many of you own a house now? Okay, what's most, okay, who can tell me what their, their interest rate is on their mortgage right now? About four and a half, right, maybe three, depending where you are. Who remembers what their interest rate was for those of you that owned homes in the early 1980s? 19, 19 or 23. You want to have kids when you're paying that kind of money for a house? So again, we see this emergence throughout the 1980s in terms of pe both parents being in the workforce, high interest rates, recession, right? all of these things happening in the world. And the birth rates continue to plummet. Enter the 1990s. Our birth rates remain low. There's really only, the average family is only having 1.5 children compared to about four children in the 1950s. You can see how this trend is starting to impact the people in the world, and more particularly for our interest's sake, what's happening in the workforce. We also start to see the creation of what we call MIC jobs, <laughs> the part-time jobs, the casual jobs. Because at this point in time, who actually has all the jobs that have pensions and benefits and are full-time? Who's got them? The baby boomers. So now all we have in the workforce and what gets created are people who need to be looking for casual work, for part-time work, and we see the emergence of this whole other trend in terms of the type of work that gets created for people. So this leads us to a very different kind of reality for each different generation. And that's what we're going to highlight even a little bit more for you because it becomes really important to understand what has impacted each generation and therefore why they're showing up the way they are in the workplace. Why are you showing up the way you do in life and in the workplace? So now in the 21st century, this is where all of us are very familiar with what's happening now. Women, of course, are waiting much longer to have families. Uh, people are very focused on education, and they no longer think of having just a job for the rest of their life. 
They think of a career as being multiple jobs. And they think of it as being in multiple industries in some cases, or certainly multiple companies. So this creates an interesting dilemma for us in terms of our skilled labor and the availability of that skilled labor for every single one of us. What this means for us now is that for the first time in modern history, we are all now dealing with a workforce that has at least three or four generations. And get ready for this, by 2020, we're going to have five generations in the workplace. Because that next group is coming. So this creates some interesting challenges for us and some amazing opportunities in terms of how do we leverage this and work with it as opposed to looking at you know, the downsides and the difficulties of it. So each generation is really a reflection of what was going on at the time that they grew up. In those formative years, from 1 to 20, what was really happening for each of those different generations? And that's what we're going to take a little bit of a look at here. So for the purposes of today, and depending where you look at the sources, you'll see certain variations in some of the years from time to time. But this is really how we're going to break it down. The four generations that we're looking at, there's the traditionalists born between 1922 to 1945. Do we have anyone a traditionalist in the room? Not as many, typically, no. Okay, Because these are the ones that are almost out of the workforce. Baby boomers born between 1946 to 1964. Show of hands, where are the baby boomers in the room? OK, good chunk of you, for sure. And then Generation X, born between 1965 and 1978. Hands up, who's a Generation Xer in the room? OK, good, almost the other half of you. And Gen Y are the millennials, born between 1979 to 2002. Where are you at, Gen Y? About a handful of you. OK, good. So you know where you're at, <laughs> and you'll like, position this. Understand now, as we talk about each of the different generations, there's a number of stereotypes. And I recognize this. It's not going to apply to every single individual. You may say, hey, that's not me. But in broad terms, I'm going to talk about what are some of the stereotypes that are associated with each generation and why we tend to believe the things we do about each of them. Why do we need to learn about them? Well, some of these sentences or some of these descriptions may be familiar to some of you. You may have thought or said them yourselves. Okay. This is actual comments taken from at Newcast Coaching and Consulting. We've been doing for the last 10 years a great deal of research with employers and employees on what attracts, retains, and engages them in the workplace. And in the interviews that we conducted, getting them to talk about working with other generations in the workplace, this is some of the data that we collected. Some of the words have been modified to be even more <laughs> politically correct, but you get the intent. Okay. This is some of what we hear. So the traditionalists, again, we don't have many traditionalists left in the workforce. These were, you know, the other, the other term they're known as is as veterans. Um, again, these were the people that would have grown up, survived the Depression. They would have fought in World War I. Um, there are some still remaining in the workforce, but many are now starting to exit. But this is the generation for sure that if there ever was a group that walked uphill both ways to school, in bare feet, in the middle of winter, this was the group that did it. And you've probably heard those stories, those of you who are baby boomers. But if you were raised by a veteran or traditionalist, consider the work ethic you would have grown up with. You put your head down, and you worked hard, and you did what you were told. Because that's how a traditionalist would have raised you more than likely. And I see some of your heads nodding already. You're like, yep, I get that. And you don't waste anything, <laughs> right? You focus on you know, using what you've got. You make the most of it. My grandmother, bless her heart, 96 years old. She is still to this day the only person I know that makes lasagna out of cornflakes and hot dogs. Because <laughs> that's what she's got in the cupboard. That's what she does. Okay. Baby boomers. Uh, where are my baby boomers again? Raise your hand. All right. You might start to recognize yourself in this. Our baby boomers, resourceful, competitive, hardworking, all these things that can describe baby boomers. Our baby boomers, again, those of you born between about 1946 to 1964, you have been and continue to be in many ways the largest demographic group, as I mentioned before, that we have ever seen in modern history. You have literally shaped 
society. For better or for worse, large, large part of what we have today is a result of the baby boomers. You are that massive bubble of people that we created and we built more schools because of you. We then built more universities for you. We are now building more hospitals and golf courses for you than ever seen before. But these were the influences for your generation. And of course, there's many. But you grew up in an era, again, raised by traditionalists, generally speaking. You learned to work hard. You learned that because of your sheer size of numbers that you could make change happen. Tremendous invention and innovation was created by boomers. Um, you, of course, were the first people to put a man on the moon. So baby boomers, we owe you quite a bit. You also invented rock and roll, by the way. And if any of you remember being in the 1950s and growing up at that time, what was rock and roll going to do to us all? It was the devil music, right? It was just rock and roll was going to be the end of society. So baby boomers, you actually had a pretty bad rap when you were growing up. And sometimes we forget that. But every generation has had a bad reputation in some way, shape, or form. So baby boomers today in the workforce, generally speaking, how you are recognized is this, that you are today's leaders. You are considered the workaholics. You were the ones, after all, who invented the 60-hour work week. Thank you very much. Okay, But you have that strong work ethic. And in terms of getting ready to retire, well, quite frankly, that's changed too. Because you're also the first generation to say, 65, retire? Mm, I don't know about that. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I'll go down to part-time. Maybe I'll semi-retire. That's also created some really interesting dilemmas in the workforce. For the Gen Xers and the Gen Ys coming up into the workforce, they have not seen the same availability of jobs that you had going into the workforce. Which has, had to, which has led to many different innovations in terms of all different types of contracting and casual work and switching jobs, careers, et cetera. Because again, baby boomers, you take up a lot of space in the world, a lot of space in the workplace, a lot of space in those jobs. In terms of characteristics typically associated with your generation, you are seen certainly as being a very straightforward group. Uh, again, hardworking, Sometimes they're certainly resistant and wanting to avoid change, although I think that's pretty much a very common human characteristic in general. But you're also used to, and we mentioned this was highlighted earlier this morning, you're used to doing more with less. Because you had to growing up. Your parents may not have had much to offer you growing up. So you learn to make do with what you had. You learn to go outside and to build things with your own hands and to make do and you create all of these things and become innovative. You are also very used to hierarchical organizational structures. You do what you're told. That's the world you entered the workforce into, and that's what you're used to. So it's no challenge for you, generally speaking, to have a boss and a boss above that boss and someone else that you have to report to. It's something that you're used to. In terms of working and communicating with boomers, and I share this more for any of the Gen Xs and the Gen Ys in the room, because as you start to understand what makes a baby boomer tick from this perspective, there's some things to know about communicating to them. Because sometimes what I tend to hear from people who are in the younger generations is that, well, they don't want to change. They always think that their way is the right way and they know how to do it all. Or, you know, I, I can't get a hold of them fast enough. So part of communicating with boomers is about respecting the face-to-face -face communication. For most baby boomers, generally speaking, this is still a really important part of how we communicate. That I want to talk to you face to face, and I want to make sure that I'm not just trying to communicate with you through a text message with our head down where we're not even looking at each other. So we try to communicate wherever possible with you can face to face and try and learn from them, because they do have a lot to offer. We also need to opt for face to face uh, voice to communication whenever possible. Um, and understand that the internet, as amazing as it is, is not a substitute for real life experience. So it's about respecting the fact that baby boomers have put in that time. They have the most years and turn the most experience and generally speaking, a greater amount of wisdom because of their time and on, on this earth. So respect some of that and try to learn from it. 
Now, I don't mean slow down and speak loudly because they can't hear you. I don't mean it from that perspective. But baby boomers in general, though you are becoming much savvier with technology, needless to say, generally speaking, you are not as savvy with it as a Gen X or certainly not a Gen Y. So when you're trying to learn technology, and this is part of the challenge too, often what I'll hear from baby boomers is, ah, oh, younger generation, that's all they want to do is you know, be on their computers, be on their phones, and you know, that's just so dumb. Well, it's not dumb. There really is a value to it, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we get into Gen Y. But rather than dismissing it as dumb or lazy or whatever it is, also start looking at what are the benefits of this technology for us? Not just as a generation, but as a company. Because like it or not, technology is here to stay. And we're only going to start seeing more of it, and it's going to change faster than any of us can possibly imagine. So in communicating with boomers, especially when you know, technology is not as intuitive, try to communicate more and help show them how to use it, how to leverage it. Because here, Gen X and Gen Y have a tremendous amount to offer. That being said, who do you think is still the largest group of online shoppers? Baby boomers, it's you. <laughs> you may not have mastered all the little apps and things that come on your phone, but boy, you can shop online. Because again, you now have the wealth, you have the resources, you have the time to be able to do that. So still big internet users. Again, in terms of communicating with boomers, remembering that there is, generally speaking again, for all people, but especially in this generation, there is some resistance to change. And when we're communicating with boomers, we also have to communicate the value and the why. And this actually becomes critically important when we talk about each generation as well. But it's, in this case, it's also making sure, not just say, this is how it is, do it. We need to start talking more with each other about why are we doing this? Why is this important? All right. Gen X. Where are my Gen Xers again? Raise your hands in the room. OK, got a number of you here. I am a Generation X too, by the way. Um, so those of you around, you know, again, in this, in this stage, you are. Um, like the generation before you, uh, you were given a very bad rap. Certainly when you first came into the workforce, and this generation, you will recognize some of the photos up there. Who actually remembers a cassette tape? Rotary phones? Do you remember that? <laughs> I have a daughter now, I have a small child, three years old, took her into like a Value Village store the other week. She saw, sitting there on the counter, like on one of the shelves, an old Fisher Price rotary phone. A, she had no idea what that was. And then when I explained to her what, that it was a phone, she had no concept of why on earth that receiver was attached with a cord to the base of it. It's something she's never seen in her life, and she never will, other than in a store or in some kind of museum. Again, look at how much times have changed. Because we can actually start to remember these things when we think back. Generation Xers, you were also deemed you, to be slackers. <laughs> you had poor work ethic. You were seen as far too independent and stubborn and having no respect for corporate life. You were seen as the group that just hated everything. You hated the, uh, the hippies. You hated the yuppies, all of those different pieces. Um, you sneered at the establishment and at wealth, and you wanted to carve your own path. Well, Generation Xers are also the ones who created work-life balance. Because remember, the baby boomers were the ones who gave us the 60-hour work week. And Gen X was the next group to say, you know what, I don't want to work like that. And here's a bit of why. Gen X, in terms of your influences growing up, and some of you remember, remember Sesame Street? Remember when like Sesame Street was the thing on TV uh, and not the bazillion shows we now have on Netflix? Uh, but things like Sesame Street, the creation of MTV, whoever had a Game Boy, right? some of these things showing up. That being said, too, this was also an era where the divorce rate tripled. So for the most part, many Gen X kids were the first generation raised where parents were divorced. So you were dealing with single parent families, people struggling to get by, and dealing with the effects of that. This meant, and this generation was the first group that was referred to as the latchkey kids. And some of you may even remember going through that or knowing kids your age who were going through that, where they were the ones who had to let themselves in after school because their parents weren't home. They were both working, or it might have been a single-parent family. 
So this group, by your very nature of how your generation was raised, learned to be extremely independent and to not rely on anything or anyone. Remember, this was also the early 1980s, and the recession was happening. So what happened to a lot of people in their jobs at that time? They got laid off. So most Gen X kids saw their baby boomer parents getting laid off. Do you think those children grew up wanting to become part of a corporate entity and wanting to do, you know, do it for the company and you know, go for the pension, go for the benefits? They did not. Because they saw what happened, that companies are not always loyal. That in hard times, people lose their jobs. So this was the first generation that said, actually, no, I'm not going to devote my life to just one company. I'm going to work for me and make sure that I'm safe and secure. It was a very massive shift in terms of what happened in our society. So it created much more of a distrust of institutions. And this generation, of course, was the first generation that really started becoming adaptable to technology. This, our generation, Gen X, is the first generation that can remember when there was no internet and when there was. Millennials, Gen Y, they didn't know a world without the internet. But most of us in the room, save for some of the, the oldest Gen Ys, we can all read. You remember what that was like when there was no such thing as Google? And you actually had to wait for like Encyclopedia Britannica to show up in the mail so you could get that information? Right? This is part of how the shift has happened. So in terms of working and communicating with Gen X, some things to think about with this group. And again, Gen Xers, you're gonna, I'm talking in a lot of broad generalizations, but you can you know, obviously speak to some of this too. So with Gen Xers, you do have to, generally speaking, prove yourself to them to gain some respect. Because they tend to be just a little bit more by their nature, a little bit more distrustful, and because they, have, they believe and they did have to work very hard to get to where they got in the workplace, because they were coming up right behind those boomers who typically had all the good jobs, and Gen Xers really had to work hard and prove themselves to get into it in the first place, in turn, they're expecting you to prove yourselves to them. They've also now, Gen Xers, we are at a, you know, I mean, we're not super young anymore. We're certainly not in our 20s or even our 30s. So we've been around the block a few times now, too. And when communicating with a Gen Xer, you do also want to get to the point. There's still value in face-to-face -face communication, but there's also a high preference for email and electronic communication. Okay? This is what the, we were, the Gen Xers were the first generations that saw the advent of email and wanted to see more communication happening that way. Gen Xers tend to expect change, and they handle it. Not always beautifully, but in general, they handle it well. Um, and they're a group that will work hard, for sure, but they're not a big fan of all the overtime. They're not a fan of the 60-hour work week. They wanted more of that work-life balance, and they strove to create that for themselves. And this whole idea of let's start looking at flexible scheduling started with Generation X. And that's only continued and, of course, become a much bigger thing. All right. So Gen Y, because this is the group that currently tends to be the one that has the biggest, baddest rap of them all. Uh, we have here lots of things about Gen Y, both in the media and both in the, the companies that I work with. Um, there's all kinds of words to describe them. Uh, but Gen Y, again, this is our group born between 1979 to 2002. They have brought a tremendous amount to the workplace. This is by far one of the best educated most globally connected workforces we have ever seen. Because again, they grew up in the age of the internet. So they've changed a whole lot of things in the workplace, including the dress code. Right? Some of you are going, oh god, I know, I know. My kids were doing that, or I know I've seen that around, right? This is the group again that um, has changed a whole lot for us. Here's the thing about Gen Y. Some of you remember, who knows who remembers what a magazine is? <laughs> Time Magazine, if you've ever seen it or read it. Time Magazine, um, this came out a while ago, but it, you know, it really highlighted them, and this is also how they've become known as the me generation. Again, that entitled generation that is somehow so selfish, the invention, of course, of the selfie. We have the millennials to thank for that, right? And now the selfie stick. <laughs> so all of these things that showed up. And yet, they, this is part of the rap that they get, but what we're not always talking about, and certainly not what we're seeing in the media, 
is the strengths that this generation is bringing to us and to our workforce. And because here's the key thing that we really need to understand about Gen Y and how this is impacting our workforce right now. In just this year, for the very first time, baby boomers, and that was a good chunk of you here in the room, you used to be our largest workforce. That is no longer true. Millennials are now, as of 2017, the biggest generation in the Canadian workforce. And so for the last decade or more, we've been talking about this tipping point coming, tipping point coming, where the baby boomers are going to you know, exit and the millennials are going to be here. Well, it's here. So if there are already challenges for you in terms of attracting and retaining and engaging your younger workers, that's only going to get worse. Which means we have to start becoming more creative and more innovative about how do we engage and work with this group of people. How do we attract them to the forestry industry? How do we bring them to camps that have no Wi-Fi? These are some things we have to start thinking about. And I'm sure you already are. Because let's consider this generation and what has really influenced and impacted them. This is the group, of course, again, they grew up in the 1980s, 1990s. The internet was here, <laughs> right? They grew up with technology. And they know it better than anybody other group on the planet. Um, they also, because of that, and because of their access to global news, were exposed to everything. They saw every natural disaster or heard about it. They saw every single um, you know, crisis that occurred in the world, economically, globally, this, which is why they're one of the best educated and most globally aware generations ever, because they've had all of this at their fingertips. It has also exposed them to a tremendous amount of violence, cultural diversity, you name it. You can you know this just even thinking of how, you, how you've seen this yourselves. So in terms of characteristics, they are a group that is more globally concerned than any other generation that we've seen before them. They are the ones that want to make a big impact. They want to save the planet. They want to do something that will create positive change, even if they're not always sure exactly what that positive change might be. They want to be engaged, and yes, they are hardwired to the internet, and to their smartphones. How many of you have a smartphone on your table beside you right now? OK, number of you. How many of you have been able to go this morning without checking it? Two hands up in the room. How many of you could go a whole day without your phones? Hands up. A few people in the room, OK? But it's not a lot. Now consider this. Is here's the other thing about technology that we need to understand. Those smartphones, do you know what happens every time there's a little ding on that phone or a buzz, you get a text message? Anyone know what happens in the brain? You get a shot of dopamine, which is another brain chemical in the, in the brain. Dopamine is one of the, the basically it's the center of the, the chemical that gets stimulated for, with pleasurable activities. And it's a numbing chemical. So it's the same chemical that gets stimulated by smoking, Drinking and gambling. And now consider the fact that all of those three things have age restrictions on them. Do smartphones? Nope. But we let our children have access to cell phones with all these apps, with all these things that releases an unprecedented amount of dopamine in the brain, and then we wonder why they can't possibly go without them. It's no different than if we literally said, hey, you know what? Feel it a little bit down, a little bit shy, a little bit nervous? Have access to my liquor cabinet. And that may seem harsh, but the chemical reality of the brain proves it to be true. So there's very good reason why Gen Y is not going to let that cell phone go. And they're not going to let that connection go to the internet and that access to their, it is what their brains have grown up with. They're developing brains, because the brain doesn't actually finish developing until we're 25 years old, fully. right? And even then, we know that we can continue to change the brain now. So <laughs> I'll share this with you. Some of you will know this, if so, any of you have had, you know, if you've had children in the last probably 10 to 15 years. This is an example. How many of you have small children, or even now teenage children? Okay, any of you who might have gotten this, this is an example of actually my stepdaughter, who's now a millennial in the workforce. This was an example of the daily report card that used to come out from daycare. 
Okay, when we think about how these, this millennial generation was parented, just take a look at this for a second. The children's daily report. So I know first thing in the morning or AM snack, my little girl had bagel with cream cheese. And I know that she had lots of it, not just a little bit or a fair amount, but lots. Okay, good. So I know she had a good breakfast. She's going to be set for the day. She's going to be a doctor. I can rest well knowing that, that my little three-year-old is going to be doing well in life. Then we see what she has for lunch. Oh, but she only had a little bit of Greek salad for lunch. I wonder what was going on there. But I know that she had a PM snack. She had a bottle at 245. Not like, look at the level of detail in these reports. And oh, get this. At 948 in the morning, she had a BM. <laughs> Do I really need to know that as a parent? Do I? But this again, so here's the other influence of our Gen Y generation. Raised, and any of you familiar with the term helicopter parenting? Okay, helicopter parenting, the style of parenting that evolved in the 1980s, 1990s, that raised this generation, considered to be the parents that hovered over their kids and did a lot, if not almost everything, for them. And here's part of the challenge with that. This generation was raised with parents that did everything to take care of them because suddenly safety was becoming a major concern. This was the era, remember the show America's Most Wanted? This was the era of America's Most Wanted. Any of you remember the picture of missing kids on milk cartons? This was that era. So parents became super concerned for their children's safety. They became concerned with the race to get into good schools, good colleges, good universities, and they started doing everything for their kids. Baby boomers, how many of you remember just leaving the house and going to play? And ba basically nobody checked up on you unless you didn't show up late at night, right? Nowadays, do we just let our children go and run out and play? No, we schedule play dates and we go with them and it's all supervised and everybody's just watched. And then we wonder, why this group doesn't cope quite the same way in the workplace. So baby boomers and older Gen Xers, who raised these Gen Ys? You did. And I don't mean you specifically, of course, it was none of you in this room, but your generation, right? We raised this group, they were raised to be told that you have opinions and you can always logically argue your cause that you can do anything you want and everyone gets a prize right this is the error now even if i trip and i don't finish the race i still get a prize the same as the person who came in first and yet the research shows very clearly that what, when we do that when we do that to our kids it devalues the prize for the kid that actually came in first because it doesn't mean anything anymore. And the kid that came in last actually still feels quite embarrassed to have gotten that prize because they know they didn't earn it. But this is how this generation has been raised. And then we wonder why they show up in the workplace and they feel entitled. Why they don't get that promotion within six months and why they're not CEO within a year. But this was the group that was told, you can have anything you want but they maybe were just forgotten, they forgot to get in the part of, but you've got to work really hard for it. So we have to start considering some of these impacts. Baby boomers, how many of you were raised with this belief? Knowledge is power. For sure, right? That was the mantra, because knowledge was hard to come by. In this day and age, this day and age, we know that knowledge is at everyone's fingertips. So for Gen Y now, they know this better than anyone, knowledge and power is, power is gained by sharing knowledge, not hoarding it. It's a totally different way of operating now in the workplace. And Gen Y wants to collaborate. They're used to it. It's how they were brought up through the school systems. They learn in teams now. They continue to want to do that in the workplace. They don't want to be as independent as Gen Xers were. They want to collaborate, but that means sometimes they might seem like they're in your face all the time. And of course, they want to communicate a lot more using technology. They want those text messages. They want that instant messaging. They want it all done through apps. So in terms of working and communicating with Gen Y, we have to respect those skills because they are amazing at it. And again, technology is not going away anytime soon. It's only going to continue to increase and change at an unprecedented rate. So we need to use this to our advantage when communicating with them.
which means that yes, though as a baby boomer or a Gen X, I might value more face-to-face -face communication, I have to start becoming a little bit more savvy with how and when am I communicating to a Gen Y? And what medium am I using? And can I learn more of this? And learn it from them. It's not always that the what we're communicating needs to change, but it's the how. And when we think about having all these generations in the workplace, we have to remember we can't communicate just one way anymore. It can't be that we just send out a memo or that there's you know, some kind of in-person town hall meeting you know, or something happening in a room. We have to make sure we're covering all mediums. We have to make sure that we're clear with Gen Y in terms of that they understand how they can make a difference at work because they were also raised to believe that they need to accomplish something positive and impactful. And they want to do this. They really do. And sometimes we just think, oh, they are lazy, they have no work ethic. They absolutely do. Every Gen Y I've ever met actually has very strong work ethic. It's just not the same as ours. They don't believe that it means I go to a job and I work from nine to five or nine to nine, but that I have more flexibility in how I do that, that I can do it remotely, whatever that looks like. So they just have a different way of looking at it. And they do want to be supported and they want to hear that feedback regularly. They're used to it, it's what they were raised with, was to constantly have that ongoing feedback and communication um, and, you know, and they're used to parents who hovered over them. So although that can sometimes seem like a challenge for us to deal with, we have to find that balance point between providing some of that and helping them learn to be more independent and more self-sufficient. But the key is this, and this is really true of all the different generations, which is that if you can harness those strengths of each and what they're super good at and what their knowledge base is and harness all of that, you have a workforce that becomes unstoppable. Because every single generation, like I said, had your bad rap. Every group in their 20s was somehow maligned by the media, by society in general. We just tend to forget. Baby boomers, we forget that you had a bad rap. Gen Xers, we forget we once had a bad rap because all that attention is now on the millennials. But get ready, because in another 15 or so years from now, all you're going to be hearing about is Gen Z, Generation Z, the next one coming into the workforce by 2020. So I guarantee you there'll be some bad rap about them. And the thing is, rock and roll, which was supposed to destroy the generation so long ago, well, look at this, we survived. Baby boomers, thank you, you partied so hard, you moved through the 60s and into the 70s, and you actually invented disco. I'm not sure anyone's going to recover from that, but you did. Um, and in this day and age, yes, we will survive Facebook, we will survive social media and all the other stuff that's out there. We just have to learn how to adapt and make it work for us as opposed to it controlling us. So the thing I want to leave you with today is this. Regardless of what generation you belong to or what you're working with, to remember that how you were raised and how you did things has a huge influence on your expectations of others. And as those expectations may not always be reasonable. Because a Gen Y did not grow up the same way as a baby boomer. And we have to respect and understand those differences. So don't also believe all the hype and the stereotypes, and like we've touched on a lot of them today, and they're not all true. There's some kernels of truth to it, but in general, again, when you really get to know people and know their actual work ethic and how they see the world and what their beliefs are, it becomes much easier to connect with them and understand how to work with them better. We also have to look for what's similar and what we have in common. And the bottom line is, when I talk to anyone, regardless of their age, what they want is to feel seen and heard and to know that what they're doing makes a difference. We all share that in common as human beings, regardless of how we work with it, whether it's through a smartphone or at a face-to-face -face meeting or however it is we communicate. And so look at the strengths and gifts of each group and work it to your advantage. Consider how you're doing your work and what can you offer that will help make your environments more attracting and engaging for millennials, especially if you want to continue to you know, have growing your workforce. And our differences can actually increase productivity and our customer satisfaction. It's when we know how to harness that, because if you know how to harness the Gen Ys as your employees, you'll also have a much better sense, because remember, those Gen Ys are also becoming all your major customers. So we need to understand and leverage this group more than anything. And of course, 
to point the finger, to lay blame, never actually solves anything. It only makes things worse and it keeps us more disconnected from each other. So wherever possible, get to know people of the different generations. Get to know people who are simply different than you because we have this habit of human beings as aligning ourselves with people who are just like us, who think like us, who kind of look like us, who talk, you know, again, same backgrounds. But the way to really learn is to start spending time with people who are different from you. In this case today, we're talking about age, but again, that could apply to just about anything. Yeah. And remember, this change has only just started. We are now at the cusp of the millennial generation now being the largest workforce. We are only going to see this speed up and accelerate. And rather than reacting to it, we can start being proactive about it and start considering how do I want to do this differently and how do I really want to make sure that I can communicate with these younger generations and harness the power and the knowledge they bring to the workplace and offer my own experience and wisdom at the same time. We have to look at it from all sides. So remember which group you're a part of and remember to take a look at the people who are in those other different demographic groups and think to yourself, what can I learn from them? because that's really where the strength is going to lie, and that's where you're going to learn the most. Right. Thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Enjoy lunch.